It's Palm Sunday, and if God's really put a weight on my shoulder, I want to work with you and talk to you right now from the gospel according to John. The 12th chapter, verses 12 through 19. And it simply says, The next day, the large crowd had come to the feast, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it was written. And this is interesting because this is the only gospel account that uses these words. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, and then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to him was they heard he had done his, he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. I want to talk to you for a few moments today. Babel, how do you see salvation? How do you see salvation? Let's pray. Father God, on this Palm Sunday, we are asking, we are moving, we are saying, let the people realize what salvation is. It is the greatest force in the human, in the universe. It has the greatest impact on the human spirit. It is one of those profoundly powerful things that sometimes I feel we don't see it right. So right now, as I get ready to deliver your word on this day and to this time, I want to ask that this word will transform. I want to ask that you will hide me behind the cross. That on this Palm Sunday, the world will know about salvation in a powerful way. In your name, amen. You know, Jermaine, one of the hardest things I find in, 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 in understanding the Bible, there's two things that are hard is understanding the cultural context and the physical manifestation of what's happening in the scripture. I don't say this in a mode of condemnation. I'm just saying this because unless you experience certain things, you can't understand them. I, I remember um, before I had the opportunity to go to Israel twice um, in the last few years, I had a different understanding of text and moment. The other thing that's really critical is that we look at the text through our own cultural lenses. And, you know, it gives us, um, it, it helps us to see the word in fresh ways and understand that the word of God, although it's never changing, hits different for different times and places. But sometimes I feel like we need to understand what's happening here from the original perspective. In this world today that is filled with so many opinions and side things, I want to spend the next few minutes talking about this triumphal entry from the perspective of salvation as it was viewed in that time, but also viewing what it means to the people at that moment. 
I think I need to step back and, and provide some background for you. You've got to understand this is the beginning of the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. After this, we will go through Holy Week. He, he will do the Last Supper on Monday, Thursday. He will be taken to kangaroo courts. And then on Friday, Friday, um, they're, going to, they're going to crucify him on the cross. He's going to spend three days in the grave, three days in the grave, but early one Sunday morning, that's my sermon for next week, early one Sunday morning, you're going to see him rise and change the very destiny of, of generations to follow over the next 2,000 years. But I think we need to do a little bit of review to understand, you know, Jesus is the son, is the son of God. He came to earth um, 33 and a half years earlier than this moment, um, you know, what really happens is that the angels come to Mary and, and, and Jesus's birth is foretold. And then, you know, he is born in the village of Bethlehem and, and the angels announce him to the shepherds and the and Magi visit and honor Jesus, the child. But because Herod wanted to kill all the children, um, Jesus and Mary had to flee to Egypt. And J Jesus eventually returns to Nazareth and Jesus being, being a young upstart goes to the temple at age 12 and says, I am in my father's house. We don't hear much about Jesus until he reaches 30 and he gets to the moment, he gets to the moment where, um, where he goes and John meets him. He meets John and John baptizes him. And after John baptizes him and the dove comes down and says, this is my son who I'm well pleased. It declares the official beginning of Jesus's ministry on earth. He then leaves and goes out into the wilderness for 40 days. And he's, he is, um, he is then tempted by the devil, but he goes and he, J Jesus begins to gather followers after and goes to Cana. He goes to a party. You know, one of his first miracles is at a party. Because I, I think Jesus understood you got to meet people where they were and he turns water into wine. And Jesus goes to the temple and then cleanses it. Then we start seeing Jesus's ministry accelerate. He goes and he speaks with Nicodemus. Um, Nick at night, he came to him at night. And then Jesus... Um, and then Jesus, he starts going into Galilee and he heals the son of, of, um, of an official. He starts teaching in the synagogue. He moves to Capernaum. He heals the lame man on the Sabbath where they start asking, um, the, the Pharisees start asking, who are you to heal a man on the Sabbath? It's interesting that when people are in power, they don't care about the the healing of people, they just care if you broke a rule. You know, you saw that in Georgia this week where, 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 where um, the, um, the knocking on the door, she cared about the rights of people. And it's interesting, on June 6th, they were walking older white women down the steps of the Capitol as soon as they ravaged it. But now we have a black woman who is there in Georgia, elected as an official, getting walked out in handcuffs. So, you know, sometimes when you're trying to do good, just like Jesus was when he healed this man on the Sabbath, the first thing the Pharisees did was say that, um, it was say that, you know, he shouldn't heal on the Sabbath. Jesus heals at the Sea of Galilee. Then he goes and he chooses his 12s and 12 disciples. And then he teaches on the Sermon on the Mount. And then Jesus, anointed by the sinful woman, he tours Galilee again. He heals the blind man. He responds to the Pharisees' charges of blasphemy because the Pharisees don't want to see people get healed. The disciples are watching, but they're not exactly sure what they're watching. But Jesus continues his ministry. He is continuing to teach and preach, but at the final days of his ministry, he walks and he wakes a man up from the dead, and that is Lazarus, and people can't believe it, but the Pharisees are still criticizing Jesus. And it's amazing with this backdrop of a Savior who is 
first of all, concerned with the marginalized, concerned with the common man. And you have the juxtaposition of the Pharisees that, one, are concerned with the rules. It gives us an interesting backdrop for this moment in his ministry. So as we look at the text that I read earlier today from the book of John, I want to do a character study. I want to do a character study of three people in this text, three people in this text. I want to first talk about the Pharisees. Then I want to spend some time about talking about the disciples. And then I want to spend some time talking about the crowd. My first point today is I want to deal with the dogma of the Pharisees. You go to the end of the text as it was read this morning. It's interesting because John, more clearly than any of the other Gospels, lays it out for us and it says, So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you, you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. You know what's interesting about this point in the text, Carl? What's interesting about this point in the text? You have those who are supposed to be the religious, who are supposed to be the faithful, who are supposed to be the ones that are seeking God's heart, those that spend time in the temples, those that have spent time reading the scrolls and studying it. They are faced with the messianic here, and all they are concerned with is... They're gaining nothing. This thing blew my mind. In the Luke version of this story, in the Luke version of this story, it gets to the second part of it, and it talks about Jesus weeping for Jerusalem. And I would weep when those that have spent their life supposedly following and studying God are so caught up with dogma instead of reality that they miss the move of God. I want to spend some time right here, right here on this because, because we live in a culture that has become dogmatic but has lost the presence of God. I'm very cynical of any um, religious view that starts with the framing of a political issue. Because we are no longer letting the word dictate our response to people. We're letting politics re lead our response to people. Now, I was, I, was, I was on social media this morning, and a young man wrote something on, on, on Twitter, and he, and he said, you know, the reason the way I am is because the church spoke so condemningly and hateful of who I was. And that thing messed me up because I was, going, I was going to leave the Pharisees for the last one, but it moved up the Pharisees to the first point. Um, because this was the interesting thing. And as the person posted it, and I was listening, reading the comments, more people were like, well, he, you know, he, he needs to learn what God has. He needs to learn what God did. He needs to learn. And, and what I realized as I started thinking about it, and God gave me new revelation, was the fact that Jesus' ministry was never one of condemnation. Jesus found those that had the biggest issues, those that had the most significant challenges in the culture, and he spoke to them right where they were. He never said, you are blind because you sinned, and now I'm healing you. No, he said, I'm healing you, and now go. I think the, 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 the apex of this kind of um, teaching in Jesus' stance was when the Pharisees brought the, the woman that was charged with adultery to him, and he looked at them, and he drew on the sand, and he said to them, um, you who has no fault, throw the first stone. I feel like we now live in a society, in a culture, in a church that is so dogmatic that we'll throw the stone and then hide our hand. One of the things we can learn from the Pharisees is that knowledge and dogma 
don't determine holiness. Actions and heart and the modeling of Jesus determine what we should determine holiness. The gospel that we have is not one of dogma. The gospel we have is one of grace and mercy. People grow deeper in their relationship with God. They want to do better out of love and growth. Condemning somebody isn't work. Now, now I know there are some, some people that we like, well, we need principles. Yes, you need principles. But if your principles sound like condemnation, instead of teaching the principles of God in the reflective glory of his grace and his mercy, it's very different. Now, I need to say something um, right now. We live in a world where people are using dogma to drive discussions. As believers in Christ, we, we need to stand against this hateful dogma. How do I know we need to stand against it? Because it's absolutely clear that's what Jesus asked us to do. As the Pharisees were pushing hateful dogma, whether it was healing somebody on a Saturday, whether it was the adulteress, whether it was Jesus entering into the city of Jerusalem um, right before they kill him, he was always at all time standing up against hateful dogma. We are not allowed to just sit back because if we are going to teach grace and mercy and we're going to teach from the principles of God, I think that's the principle we need to pick up on. The days of the church just being the church and showing up on Sunday morning are over. We now need to go out in the world. We need to be the salt of the earth. We need to be the light in the world because if we let dogma decide our position, we're no better than the Pharisees. I stress this enough. I can't stress this enough. Dogma will destroy us. It destroyed the Pharisees. The next thing is the growth of the disciples. This is an interesting point. Um, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The growth of the disciples. You know, one of the interesting things is God grows us in our walk. God grows us in our walk. You would assume that the disciples had all the answers. They'd walk with Jesus. They had talked with Jesus. They had been with him throughout his entire earthly ministry. They had seen miracle after miracle. They had seen him feed 5,000. They had seen him heal the cripple. They had seen him cast out demons. They had seen him raise a man from the dead even when he, they doubted it. So you would assume... That at this moment, it wouldn't surprise them. But what you have to understand is that as they come from Nazareth, as they come from Nazareth, Nazareth in the Galilee, which is on the outskirts, and as they enter the city on Passover, the most holy holiday, because at that time, when you wanted to celebrate Passover you know, and you were Jewish, you had to go to the temple in Jerusalem. So the city is packed. So you have these people that are from the outskirts. So you imagine somebody that lives out in Modesto and has had ministry out in Modesto and is doing great work out of Modesto, all of a sudden he walks into San Francisco and they give him a parade. They were puzzled. Don't judge them too hard. Don't, don't judge them too hard because this moment is the exponential growth and impact of Jesus' ministry. No longer is he on the outskirts. No longer is he just a rebel. Now he's impacting all the, the whole Jewish diaspora that is in Jerusalem for the Passover. But what I love about John and John is not, is not one of the, the Gospels that's real light with words. He clearly understood what he wrote. He understood, he showed that the disciples, instead of asking crazy questions, now you say, Pastor, what do you mean by asking crazy questions? Like, can I walk on water? Can we feed the 5,000? 
It's too late. Lazarus is dead. Can you raise him from the dead? They had a career of, of asking questions. But in this moment, when God moves in their ministry, moves in front of them, they start comprehending what God is doing. I said it last week and I'll say it again. Our walk with God is a walk of growth and we need to have growth like the disciples because as we see God move in exponential ways and as we see God move in community, we need to start expanding our horizons for what God could do. One of the tragic things about modern Christianity as it's taught in America today is that it is a very solitary and individualistic thing. We all have an individualistic, individual relationship with Jesus Christ because he is our Savior. But one of the interesting things is that Jesus' ministry was never about one individual. Jesus' ministry was always about working in community, whether it was the 12 or the 70 or walking through and speaking to others. The gospel is always worked out in community. And in this moment, the disciples see God working it out in community. So we as people need to grow just like the disciples and grow in community and see the miracle that God can do. Now my final point, my final point is the hope of the crowd. It's, it's described quite well in this one line. It says, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Now, I have been hard on the crowd, Samuel. I really, um, Solomon, I've been hard on the crowd. I've been hard on the crowd over all of these years. You know, um, it, it, is, it is common preaching trope to use things like, you know, they celebrated him on Sunday but killed him on Friday. And that's, that's cute. That's cute. That's cute. But that's not the truth. Not the truth. It is clear to us that the minority, which was the Pharisees and Sadducees holding on to power, ran game on the Romans and then loud loaded the crowd at Pontius Pilate's house to get the vote to crucify Jesus. It wasn't the people that Jesus had been giving hope to that were and that were in the, the street that were the ones that betrayed Jesus. What we have here is a crowd of people that have heard, and it says it in the text, it says it quite plainly in the text. Um, it says, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. These people had now an expectation because they had seen a glimpse of God. Don't judge them too hard because I would get excited if I saw a glimpse of God. Their language shows that they saw a glimpse of God because Hosanna means salvation. They saw salvation and hope. And because they are structuring it from um, a, a, a Jewish perspective of that day, they talk about the king of Israel because that's the only reference they have. It's not because they're looking for somebody to come in with an army because that would lie to their eyes. How would I expect a man that showed up humbly on a colt to show up with an army? Would I be shouting for that? Or had they seen a glimpse of the divinity of Jesus? Had they seen the miracles of him changing lives out in the country? They started hearing about God moving, and now they were like, this is where the salvation is, and this matches the idea in our mind of the king of Israel. I think sometimes, and I want to be very honest with you this morning, so many of us, We'll get a glimpse of God. Instead of having hope, we want to analyze. Instead of having hope, 
We want to figure it out. When we see the miraculous, when we see the divine, when we see God moving, sometimes we just have to be like the crowd and have hope and say, Hosanna, God is here. Hosanna, God is going to change us. Hosanna, God is still in the saving business. Hosanna, God can bring the dead back back from the grave. Hosanna, God can give sight. Hosanna, God can heal um, the issue of blood. Hosanna, God can continue to move. So many of us are trying to figure it all out, come up with a strategy, come up with a plan, do it all. But all we have to say is Hosanna and know that God can give us the salvation. This Holy Week, In this crazy world, I need you to fall in love with the mystery of God. With his power to do salvation. With his power to transform lives. You know, I've been a Christian most of my life. And I I can't explain to you the exact process of salvation. I can explain, explain the mechanics that we've come up with in this day and age where the sinner's prayer um, and understand that um, the disciples weren't doing the sinner's prayer. The sinner's prayer is, is a modern formulation. Um, please understand um, early church, um, they did it differently for different times and spaces. So I can really, sp- I, so what I could say is we all understand the mechanics of it. But I need you to fall in love with the mystery of God, that his salvatory grace is able to be seen and felt and change hearts and minds without forcing it on a person of free will. And when that happens, their life is transformed and changed for the better for the rest of their earthly existence. And after they pass away on earth, they are now in heaven with eternity, with God. They are no longer lost or broken. They have a protector and a father. They have somebody that is the propitiation of their sins. Jesus can move in mysterious ways. So right now, as you go into Holy Week, Don't get caught up in the mechanics and the traditions of it. I need you to start getting caught up in the mystery and the power of it. Because when you start thinking about the mysterious power of God, you have no choice but to lift your voice and say, he is king and he is Lord. He is creator of the universe. He is the savior of my soul. He loves me more than I love myself. He is the God that can change it all and move in my life. I don't care what the dogma is. I don't care what the crowd says. As long as I know Jesus, my life will be better. So on this day, I shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. He is the sweetest name I know. Right now, I want to do a few things as you get ready for Holy Week. I want to pray for you if you're stuck in dogma. And this morning, God gave you a revelation that it's time to shift into a new season. I want to pray for you if you're looking to grow, that God opens up revelation in a new season in this holy week. I want to pray for you. If you can't explain it all, but you have a feeling that this Jesus thing we're talking about is for you. Let's pray. Father God, on this Palm Sunday, I want to lift up a specific prayer. First, I want to pray for those whose hearts you've convicted on the dogma of the church and politics. God, as you continue to give them revelation, allow them to see you in new and beautiful and bountiful ways. Let them not be so stuck in form and function that they 
miss the miracle working power that you have. They miss all that you can do for their life. God, I want to pray for those of us that are sojourning with you. Sometimes we get into a rut. We get into a holding pattern, a circle around the drain. I pray that in this season, you open those of us that are still just sort of circling in the same place to new seasons of revelation of your love and your creation. Then, I want to pray for those that have seen a glimpse of your salvation. That mystery, that energy, that heart. I ask that you will water and nurture that. That they may experience growth and depth in you through this Hosanna moment. Talk to their heart, God. In your holy name, amen.